Hi, welcome to Spoiler Lab. No one would have guessed that when everyone was looking for a $150 million necklace, it was in the sink with the dirty dishes. Today we will recap the story of the 2018 movie Ocean's 8. An inmate named Debbie Ocean, the younger sister of the legendary Danny Ocean, is being released from prison on parole. An employee at the institution explains to the woman that she's very lucky, but from now on she's not allowed to associate with anyone with a prior criminal record, and most of Debbie's family and friends had one. The girl admits that there is nothing to be proud of, but since she really wants to change, she will try to do what she can. Debbie says that unlike her late brother, who was a born con man, she just fell in love with a bad guy. She only wants to be free and start living a simple life. Dressed up, Debbie says goodbye to a security guard she knows, who jokes ironically about her words about a simple life. Joking back, Debbie confesses that she's been practicing that phrase for five years. The guard gives her personal belongings, among which she notices an expensive wristwatch. Debbie tells her that she stole it from her brother, who also stole it. Before she leaves, the resourceful Debbie reminds the guard that there will be another shipment of cigarettes next week and she can have a few packs on top. Except it would be advisable to sell them, not smoke them. After arriving in town, Debbie immediately goes to a high-end perfume store, picks up a decent selection of cosmetics and, since she's penniless, decides to pull a little scam. At the cashier's desk she tries to arrange a simple return of the goods. The employee asks if she has kept the receipt, and Debbie tries to explain that she didn't even have time to open the package, so the goods are brand new. Since it is impossible to return the merchandise without a receipt, a distraught Debbie sort of agrees to keep the merchandise and demands a branded bag as well. After this, the woman goes to an expensive hotel, where she pulls off another scam. She follows a couple as they leave the hotel and immediately heads to the room they left behind. Posing as a guest, Debbie calls the front desk, complains about a flight cancellation and asks to find them a room for the night. The unsuspecting employee graciously offers to take the same room, which, if necessary, can even be cleaned. And so, with ease, Debbie arranges a free overnight stay. Meanwhile, a longtime friend of Debbie's named Lou Miller runs a cheap nightclub where she deals in petty scams like selling diluted vodka. Suddenly she gets a text from Debbie asking her to meet her at the cemetery shortly after. At the cemetery, Debbie decides to visit her brother's grave, where she meets his old acquaintance Reuben. The old man tries to explain to the woman that Danny wouldn't want her to do this, because that could get her sent back to prison. Debbie thanks Reuben and promises she will never go to jail again. She says goodbye to the old man, after which Lou immediately drives up to pick her up. The women hug happily after being separated for so long and Debbie immediately gets down to business, something she has been planning while she was still in prison. Debbie wonders if her friend has taken the loan she asked for, but Lou wants to hear the details of the upcoming heist first. Debbie explains that they're going to get their hands on Elizabeth Taylor's unique $150 million necklace, which is locked in a vault 15 meters deep. Lou asks how exactly they can get it out of there, and Debbie replies that they'll simply have it brought to them. Lou leads her friend to her so-called dwelling, which looks more like an old abandoned pub. Debbie looks around in surprise, and Lou tells her that she even kept all of her things, which are in one of the rooms upstairs. After getting dressed, Debbie goes to the gallery of her ex-boyfriend Claude Becker, who previously turned her into the police for fraud, which landed her in jail. The woman reminds him of what he did and tries to threaten him a little. Claude promises to call the police, but Debbie ironically replies that knowing him, she wouldn't even doubt it. She then cuts a button off his shirt in a threatening manner and leaves. After this, the friends begin to carefully plan their upcoming job. Debbie recalls that at first she wanted to rob a regular bank, but it soon dawned on her and she settled on one of New York's most chic museums, the Metropolitan. Lou warns of the extraordinary difficulty of robbing a museum of this caliber, but Debbie specifies that they don't need to rob the museum itself, just someone in the museum. Lou insists they need 20 men and a minimum of half a million dollars for an operation of this magnitude. Debbie, on the other hand, explains that according to her calculations, they only need 7 people and $20,000. So, the Met holds a big press conference every year for the next exhibition. After that, they throw a fancy reception and invite a certain big star to be the hostess of the ball. This time they invited the famous actress Daphne Kruger, but the criminals don't even need her, but rather her clothes designer. Naturally this designer should be one of their own and Rose Wiley, a charismatic Irish fashion designer who has long lost her former glory and is mired in huge debts to the tax authorities amounting to $5 million, is perfect for this role. Because of this, the authorities froze all of her accounts, seized her house, and confiscated her passport. She even took out a loan for her new show. In a nutshell, she went all in. As expected, her fashion show fails miserably, and Debbie and Lou find the crying Rose snacking her stress away on a giant jar of Nutella. The friends introduce themselves as her groupies and a heartbroken Rose complains about her miserable life. The girls try to calm her down and offer some kind of solution to all her problems. All she has to do is dress Daphne Kruger for the ball to come. 
Rose is a little hesitant to choose her outfit, but she is assured that it is not the outfit that matters but the necklace. Rose replies that it's not her style, but Lou emphasizes the importance and uniqueness of this diamond accessory weighing 3 kilograms and costing 150 million. Rose's main task is to become Daphne Kruger's designer and convince the girl that she absolutely has to wear this necklace. After all, if Daphne asks for it herself, she is unlikely to be able to refuse. Debbie decides to take her old friend, a skilled jeweler named Amita, to be the next member of the team. During a walk, Debbie offers Amita a job and asks how long it will take her to make seven pieces of jewelry out of cut stones. Amita replies that it would be in the neighborhood of five to six hours. Then Debbie asks how much faster would it be if she could afford to never live with her mother again. Without much thought, Amita answers that in that case it would be much faster. Another candidate for the team is an experienced hacker under the pseudonym 9. From her laptop, the girl immediately hacks into the Met's surveillance cameras, and reproaches Debbie for her digital ignorance, demonstrating that she's already managed to track her down as well. In Debbie's words, if you're planning serious business, you can't leave that much of a trail behind you online. Impressed, Debbie asks if she can clean up her trail. Debbie and Lou drive Rose to an important meeting with a big movie celebrity named Penelope Stern, who is envied by Daphne Kruger herself. The purpose of the Sly event is to get the information about their meeting into the media so that Daphne herself will want to poach Rose for herself. As expected, Daphne harshly reproaches her assistant for not having met the legendary designer Rose Wiley yet and asks for an urgent meeting. Lou and Debbie, meanwhile, instruct Rose to pay little attention to Daphne during the meeting, pretending not to be particularly interested. Immediately after meeting Daphne, Rose predictably becomes anxious and messes things up. To create the illusion of her indifference, Lou and Debbie distract Rose from outside. And while Daphne is pouring compliments on Rose and her talent, she keeps getting distracted. Eventually, Daphne becomes annoyed and the girls in the window immediately vanish. Rose finally concentrates and Daphne explicitly suggests dressing her up for a reception at the Met. Without much thought, Rose agrees. Debbie and Lou then go for a walk in New York's back alleys to recruit a slick street con artist named Constance. After watching the girl con another gawker, they invite her to grab a bite to eat at a cheap diner. Hearing their offer, Constance immediately agrees and tries to leave, but Debbie still asks for her watch back before she leaves. Next, the girls decide to invite their old friend Tammy, a professional kleptomaniac who has set up a veritable warehouse of stolen goods in her garage. Tammy tries to explain that she has a family and she's long since quit, but the amount of profit involved makes her seriously reconsider. So, all the girls gather at Lou's den, and Debbie gives them a real presentation. She immediately announces that hypothetically in five weeks they could each have $16.5 million. In three and a half weeks, the Metropolitan Museum of Art will host its annual ball to celebrate the new exhibition. It is on that evening that they will steal the magnificent necklace by Cartier, worth $150 million, which at that moment should be around the neck of the famous actress Daphne Kruger, whose stylist, in turn, will be Rose. In addition, they must retrieve the necklace from the vault, hack into the museum's security system, and blend in with the crowd, all of whom must assume they are just as important guests as everyone else. Before preparing for one of the biggest jewel heists in history, everyone tries to sort out their current affairs. Debbie tries another scam to get a loan, and Tammy tricks the kids into going away on a long business trip. In reality, she uses her passion for expensive gadgets to order a fancy 3D printer with fancy scanning glasses. The glasses, she says, can create an exact virtual model of that very necklace, and the printer will easily print a zirconia replica. Rose and Amita then head to Cartier to convince the company's employees of their intention to rent the very same necklace to Daphne Kruger. At first, they are refused, for the necklace is too expensive and can only be rented when accompanied by a bunch of security guards, which is very expensive and troublesome. But Rose skillfully manipulates the employee, explaining that many people have already begun to forget their great company. It is a shame that young people do not know about its existence, because such rare items are constantly in the vaults and never come out. Therefore, if Daphne Kruger appears in their finest jewelry, it will be very good publicity for them. They are escorted into the vaults after all, and are graciously shown the necklace. Rose puts on the special glasses, but a very weak signal from the vault prevents them from scanning the jewelry. She is at a loss, but Amita ingeniously suggests that she get a better look at the necklace under the sun by bringing it upstairs. The staff members go along and take the necklace to one of the rooms upstairs. Things work better here and the glasses begin to scan the necklace. The process is too slow and everyone around them waits patiently. Amita explains that Rose has her own methods and needs to get her inspiration from the necklace. Just when the employees are getting rather nervous, the glasses successfully finish scanning and transmit an accurate image to the joyful team members on the other side. The 3D printer, in turn, 
produces an exact duplicate of the necklace. Later, the girls decide to check out the museum's security system. While Tammy distracts a security guard in one of the halls of the Met's art gallery, Debbie displays one of the lost paintings under the guise of a donation from a famous celebrity artist named Banksy. The event causes a public outcry, and museum officials reproach the security agency for not properly performing its duties. An employee of the agency explains that Banksy has done this at other museums, because they put an emphasis on things not being stolen, and not on bringing objects in. As the unsuspecting agency employees are leaving the office, Constance bumps into one of them as if by accident and steals his pass unnoticed. She immediately passes it to Nine, who, pretending to be a cleaning lady, blatantly sneaks into the boss's office during a meeting of the board of directors and leaves a listening bug on the trash can. Now that the girls have triggered a change in the security system, they decide to discreetly make their own adjustments there as well. Since the museum grounds are strewn with surveillance cameras, they decide to stage the heist in the toilet, because by law it's the only place where it's forbidden to place cameras. But there is a camera at the toilet's exit and anyone who comes out of there becomes a suspect. So they need a courier who will take the necklace out for them and not raise suspicion. To pull this off, they need to create a blind spot, and to do that, they need to move the camera inconspicuously. All of this should take about 10 to 12 days, as planned. When asked by Amita how long it took to plan all this, Debbie ironically replies that it was about 5 years, 8 months and 12 days. Lou tells Debbie that they hired the best private security guards in the world to protect the Cartier necklace. The Pope's personal bodyguard, Guillermo de Vito, and former Mossad secret agent Yuri Yeshel. Meanwhile, Nine hacks into the security agency's website, gains access to the personal data of employees at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, goes to the Facebook page of department head Paul Dominion, who in his normal life is a carefree Wheaton Terrier lover. Hastily, in a photo editor, the girl creates another collage with cute dogs and sends it to Paul's personal messages. Opening the message, he thereby provides access to his laptop. Watching the man naively smiling at the dogs, Nine even feels a little sorry for the poor guy but she gets full access to all the museum surveillance cameras and moves the image of the right camera bit by bit, thereby creating a blind spot. Meanwhile, Tammy gets a job at Vogue magazine, where a temporary position was accidentally vacated due to the strange illness of one of the employees who was supposed to cover that very reception at the museum. Naturally, Tammy immediately gains access to the secret seating chart of the invited guests and successfully scans it with her miracle glasses. The girls learn that apparently Daphne hasn't decided on a date, because one seat next to her remains vacant. As fate would have it, Debbie's ex-boyfriend Claude Becker is on the plus one guest list. In the lead up to the ball, an official dinner is held, during which Daphne and Claude sit down next to each other and successfully get to know each other. Tammy reports this to Debbie and later wonders how she ever fell for such a jackass. Debbie recalls that she and Lou once had a fight and she decided to make a big score on her own. Ten years ago, Debbie and Lou had been running petty scams, rigging the lottery and cheating at roulette. Then a mutual friend set her up with this art dealer, with whom they worked out a simple scheme. When someone was interested in a certain work, Debbie had to present herself as another buyer and drive up the price. The money was good, she said, and that's how their relationship began. One day Claude asked her to be the seller, not the buyer. Debbie was supposed to hand over the paperwork and get the check, but it turned out to be a setup. Since her signatures were everywhere, not Claude's, she ended up going to jail. Knowing the whole backstory, Lou reproaches Debbie for deliberately luring Claude out to the reception. She suspects that somehow her friend is determined to get revenge on her ex and tries to explain that you can't bring a personal score into such an important matter. During the final preparations, Lou, Nine and Debbie check out the blind spot by the bathroom, and Tammy tries to arrange for a personal nutritionist to attend the appointment. In addition, the girls get their pre-ordered evening gowns. Rose then arranges for Daphne to pre-fit the necklace, which is delivered in a special safe. There is a small problem, she can put the necklace on without a problem, but she can take it off only with a special magnet held by a security guard. Slightly discouraged, Rose asks the guard to repeat the procedure and secretly films it on her smartphone camera. After watching the video carefully, Nine decides to involve her younger sister Veronica, a wonderkin technician, who easily creates a gadget that acts as an analog of this secret magnet. The final preparations before the ball are underway. The event organizers, including Tammy, give the final briefing to the staff. Prominent guests appear on the red carpet, and the gorgeous Daphne Kruger, accompanied by Rose and Claude, appears in all her glory and with the necklace around her neck. Not far away, disguised as a fast food van, is the mobile headquarters of the Hacker 9. Debbie shows up on the carpet alongside other showbiz and sports stars. Guests hug, talk to the press, look at valuable artifacts, and get ready for dinner. 
Daphne, Claude, and Rose take their seats, which Constance, who works as a waitress, is already watching intently. Lou, meanwhile, is doing a fine job in the kitchen and deftly slips a laxative into Daphne's portion of soup. After serving the dish, the ravenous Daphne immediately devours it with gusto. Meanwhile, Constance arranges for all the stalls in the ladies' room to be closed, leaving access only to the one where Daphne is supposed to go. Daphne's small talk is interrupted by an unexpected stomach cramp. The girl is clearly uncomfortable and jumps out of her seat and runs as fast as she can to the restroom. Cammy signals Debbie, who is already waiting outside the bathroom. Daphne bursts into the ladies' room, trying to open one stall after another until she gets to the right one. Daphne is immediately followed by the very guards of the necklace, but Debbie prevents them from entering, pointing out that it's the ladies' room. Meanwhile, Nine is watching the cameras, making sure Debbie stays in the blind spot. Just then, Constance shows up in Daphne's stall and tries to help the girl. She steals the necklace discreetly, unlocking it with a gadget. Nine signals Tammy that she has 10 seconds. Tammy catches the waiter and chides him for having dirty dishes that need to be taken to the sink right away. The waiter with the dishes heads toward Debbie, who distracts him, giving Constance a chance to sneak the necklace between the unwashed plates on the tray. Lou in the kitchen begins to get a little nervous as the waiter is delayed somewhere. Nine reports that he's stuck in the hallway, where he's chatting with his colleague. Tammy immediately heads over to them and threateningly points out his duties. The waiter urgently takes the tray to the washing room, where Amita eagerly awaits it. She dumps the dirty dishes into the sink, takes out the necklace, carefully washes it, and loudly informs her colleagues that she must go to the bathroom. There, Amita has a whole mini jewel lab already prepared and she begins to take the necklace apart. Meanwhile, Daphne is relieved to leave the restroom, and the nervous guards are waiting for her at the exit. When they see that the necklace is missing from her neck, they rush headlong to search the bathroom but find nothing. They question Daphne, but she explains she has no idea where the necklace has disappeared to. At that moment, she was clearly not interested and perhaps it just fell down the toilet. Then the guards realize the necklace is still missing and they urgently need to close off all the exits, as well as a thorough search of the guests, staff and premises. In her van, Nine happily watches as police and reporters are already arriving at the museum. As Amita continues to disassemble the necklace, one of the guards approaches her room. Nine warns of the danger and suggests action. Cammy immediately pulls out a duplicate of the necklace, pretends to find it in one of the fountains, and loudly announces it to those present. Immediately the search stops and the guests quietly return to their seats. Amita finishes taking the jewelry apart and hands it to Constance, who in turn discreetly hands it to Tammy, Debbie, Rose, and Nine, who has already gotten out of the van and changed into fancy dresses. Debbie then accidentally runs into Claude and tosses him one of the pieces of the necklace. At the end of the party, all the girls leave the building, quietly taking the necklace out piece by piece. After returning the necklace to Cartier, an employee of the company discovers that the jewelry has been forged. An astute insurance company investigator, John Frazier, is called in to investigate the case. After testing various theories and interviewing many of those involved, Fraser, who has already investigated cases involving the Ocean family, discovers that Debbie was present at the celebration, but she was in plain sight the entire time and has an ironclad alibi. As the girls are in their den celebrating a successful operation, Daphne suddenly enters the room. Most of those present are shocked, but Debbie and Lou confess that along the way they let Daphne in on their plan as she began to figure it all out. So, the $150 million will have to be split between the eight of them. Daphne warns the team that a certain insurance investigator named John Fraser is thoroughly digging into them. Debbie assures them that she knows the guy well and has everything figured out for this case as well. In order to safely sell off parts of the necklace, Debbie and Lou hire elderly actresses who, as elderly socialites, talentfully and dramatically price the diamonds at various pawn shops, presenting them as their family heirlooms. Meanwhile, the investigator begins to suspect Claude, for whom he lacks clues and evidence. In the meantime, Debbie makes an appointment with John at the diner and assures him that she has no information about the necklace itself, but knows that Claude Becker has a piece of it. The investigator guesses that this sounds like revenge, but it's important for him to find something, and he needs a good reason to get a search warrant for Claude. To that end, Daphne invites Claude to a romantic evening at his home, ties the poor man to the bed, finds the planted piece of jewelry, and sends the picture to Debbie, who in turn drops it off to Fraser. The next morning, Claude is arrested, and to make the setup look even more plausible, those elderly socialites sell their pieces at auction and transfer the money to Claude Becker's company account. As the team celebrates their eventual victory, Daphne notes that Debbie and Lou made far less money from the jewelry sale than they had originally planned. But Lou explains that while the museum was being searched, 
She and her dodgy friend Ian stole all the jewelry from an exhibit that ran parallel to the one next door, and Debbie masterfully diverted the attention of bystanders. After all, why steal one piece of jewelry when you can steal a whole bunch? And the team's share of the profits increased handsomely, to $38,300,000 each. At the end of the film, each of the team members uses the sum in their own way. Amita spends time with her lover in Paris, Rose pays off her debts and opens her own boutique, Tammy expands her sales business, Nine modestly opens a billiard club, Constance buys a spacious apartment and becomes a video blogger, Daphne starts a career as a director, and Lou embarks on a long-awaited motorcycle trip. In the last scene, Debbie arrives at her brother Danny's grave, drinks a martini and assumes he would have appreciated it. So what did you think of this movie? Leave it in the comments below and if you liked the video please like and subscribe for more movie recaps. See you next time.